is Vesela Daskalova uh, from the INET Institute at the University of Cambridge. And I will be talking to Shahar Karif, uh, who is a Professor of Economics at UC Berkeley and who is visiting INET this week. So Shahar is a major figure in economics working at the intersection of theory and experiments. And he has a variety of, I mean, numerous papers on a variety of topics, including uh, social networks, preferences, Herding behavior, information contagion, learning, to yes, mention yeah. just a few. You didn't miss of anything. <laughs> just to mention <laughs> a few of them. Uh, but obviously, we cannot cover all these topics. We'll be just talking about a few of your papers today. Uh, and um, my first question uh, is related to your idea about experiments. You are the director of the UC Berkeley um, Social Science Experimental Laboratory. Mm -hmm. And I'm just interested um, what, in your opinion, is the role? of experiments in economics? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question. We start with a great question. So, no, so I was uh, trained as, uh, as economic theorist. And when I started uh, doing uh, experiments, this was in some sense a deviation for me uh, from what I was trained in. And I think that, you know, traditionally, uh, economists uh, did not use uh, experiments. You know, we were late to adapt experimental methods relative to the other social sciences. And I think that the view was that unlike psychology, for example, uh, in economics, we actually have a lot of data from the real world, maybe even too much data that we cannot digest. So what's the point of generating more data in the laboratory? I think that we pretty quickly, this, you know, this happened in the 50s, we understood that even if we have a lots of data from the real world, also in physics, there is a lot of data from the real world, uh, but still people are doing controlled experiments. And the advantage of a controlled experiment is that uh, unlike in the real world, uh, where many things are unobserved, uh, in an experimental setting, you can basically uh, control information and beliefs um, and you can put what I call behavior under the microscope. Now, of course, when you put things in an experimental setting, there are external validity issues, so it, it comes with cost, of course. Now, I would say that there are basically, not only in economics, there are two types of experiments. There are the experiments that I would call them fishing for facts, and there are the experiments that are testing theories. I think that you know, many experiments in social sciences that are not in economics, they are basically fishing for facts. You have two treatments, and in between these two treatments, everything is identical, and you just change one aspect of the experiment, and you see how it changes behavior. And you know, these experiments, they basically discover new things on which our theory has very little to say, or that there is no theory at all. And uh, people developing theories based on the experimental results. Uh, the other type of experiments, which I'm uh, a bigger fan, uh, yeah, probably it's obvious <laughs> uh, from the way that I introduced the two types of experiments. Uh, the other types of experiments, um, these are experiments that are basically testing theories. Uh, we have, uh, a, you know, in economics, we have very parsimonious models. We have very parsimonious theories. That's the strength, probably, of economics. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't, you know, what does it mean to test a theory or to test a model? All models in some sense are wrong. Uh, so there is a delicate issue here, he, I think. Uh, but I would basically say that for me, uh, the laboratory, uh, I use it as a wind tunnel for my theories. And I'm basically in the laboratory, I'm trying to create an environment in which the assumptions of the theory are satisfied to the fullest possible degree, which of course doesn't happen in the real world. And then by basically putting behavior under the microscope in this way, we are trying to later on see where the theory succeeds, succeeds where the theory fails, and to improve our theory. So this was a long answer yeah. uh, for, <laughs> for a short question. Uh, but I guess at the same time you could argue that these experiments that are fishing for facts uh, they might be also crucial for developing new theories. Yes, so I think that, you know, um, the example that I always give is the, you know, is the enormous amount of work and the very productive dialogue that was between theory and experimentations in decisions under risk. You know, uh, 
right after the Neumann Morgenstern expected utility, Alley came with a thought experiment. Alley didn't do any experiments that basically showed that there is something, I wouldn't say fundamentally wrong, but that human behavior can, uh, you know, uh, can is in odds, let's say, uh, with some aspects of expected utility. And it is true that by this type of uh, a la Alley experiments, uh, new theories were developed. So uh, this definitely can be, uh, you know, a fruitful avenue as well. Uh, I'm less engaged in this type of research, yes. My next question is about your own work. So basically you have done a series of lab experiments uh, trying to elicit people's preferences from their choices in the lab. And these experiments that you have done are quite different from the ones that had been done previously in economics and psychology, although there is mm -hmm. a lot of research on the topic. Can you elaborate a bit on the differences? Um, yeah, so, no, I, I think that you know, what we observe, or what we observe in the real world, or what we observe in experiments, we observe behavior. We don't observe the underlying preferences. And from choice behavior, we are trying to understand uh, individuals' uh, underlying preferences. Now, of course, this is a very, very difficult identification problem because not only preferences determine choices. The other thing that determine choices are, for example, constraints, and it can be monetary constraints or non-monetary constraints. Uh, it can be information uh, or it can be beliefs. So the first thing that we need, we need uh, a rich choice environment uh, such that we can distinguish, let's say in the laboratory, preferences from constraints uh, while uh, holding information constant, this is something that we can do in the laboratory, and elicit the beliefs. Okay? So I think that um, uh, what we were basically motivated by, we were motivated by what we found are uh, fundamental questions about preferences. So the first fundamental about question is about preferences is in some sense whether preferences even exist in the sense of whether we have purposeful, wh whether we are purposeful in solving trade-offs. So the first question that we wanted to ask is, is behavior, is individual behavior consistent with basically the utility maximization model as we know it in economics or with rationality in the sense of having a complete and transitive preference ordering? And previous experimental result basically uh, could not provide a strong test. So we uh, looked for ways such that we can generate a rich, it's not enough that it will be large, also it should be rich, individual level data on which we can study behavior at the level of the individual subjects. And the way that we basically managed to do this, I think, is moving by from what traditionally experimenters do, and this is giving subjects to choose between binary or discrete set of choices, we basically gave subjects to choose from budget sets, like in principles of economics. The issue was how you present budget sets to uh, experimental subjects. And the way that we overcome it is by presenting the, sub the budget sets graphically, so people see representations of these budget sets on the computer screen. And these are people, of course, with no training in economics. And they are making decisions using a, a point and click design. Mainly they are moving the mouse and choosing allocations on the budget set. And uh, uh, with this technique, uh, we were able uh, first uh, to generate many observations uh, per subject in a wide range of scenarios which allows us to have a strong test of revealed preference conditions in the data. And we know that revealed preference conditions in the data basically contain all information about preferences. So we did two things. First, we test for the consistency of choices with utility maximization. Luckily for us, I think that most subjects come close enough to consistency such that, that we can think that their choices are utility generated. And then we were able to move and study the structure of the underlying utility function and also to recover uh, the underlying preferences. And we did it in a range of domain from uh, preferences under risk, preferences under uncertainty, time preferences, social preferences, uh, moral preferences and other types of preferences. And we did it with the standard pool of undergraduate students, but we also did it with large and representative samples of the 
uh, Dutch-speaking population in the Netherlands and now with the US population as well. Uh, in one of these papers, you actually attempt something that is very interesting, I think. Um, you try to, uh, to investigate the relations between uh, people's, uh, how consistent choices people make in the lab uh, and uh, variables uh, in real life, such yeah. as their uh, income, wealth. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more about this? So, so how far can you get with this? What are the limitations of yes. wh what you can say? this analysis? Yes, so, um, uh, you know, th th there, is a, there is a view now in economics, which, you know, I'm sympathetic to, uh, that people vary in their decision-making abilities. You know, some people are good decision-makers and some people are bad decision-makers. I think in some sense we need to accept that there is heterogeneity in decision-making abilities because there is heterogeneity in everything else. Uh, and in this view, those with low decision-making abilities are making uh, low-quality decisions. And of course, if there are people that are making low-quality decisions, then there were um, uh, economists, um, uh, many of them actually, that suggested what we call light paternalistic policies. You know, let me help you. Uh, so I think that this paper is actually an attempt uh, to go into this direction and by first defining people that are, uh, have uh, low decision-making abilities. What we do in economics is that mainly to identify them, you know, we can use, for example, IQ as proxy for economic rationality with all the difficulties. We, of course, objected <laughs> uh, this view. So, the, the, the in some sense, the, the strategy in this paper is as follows. We did the experiment with a, represent, a large and representative sample, uh, not undergraduate students. And on this sample, we have a very good, um, especially good, survey data on psychological and economic measures. And what we wanted to find, of course, is correlation. We wanted to find correlation between this measure of rationality in the laboratory. And the measure of rationality is how close you are to satisfy revealed preference conditions. This is rationality, as economists talked about it, to economic outcomes in the real world. However, the exercise, and this is important to emphasize, the exercise is more than external validation. I'm not basically saying that your risk attitudes in the laboratory are your risk attitudes in the real world when you basically purchase insurance, for example. Mm -hmm. We try to do something different, I would say bigger than that. We wanted to show whether uh, rationality in the experiment itself can predict large economic, economic outcomes that involves many decisions over uh, lots of time. And for this, what we did, we basically sh wanted to show and wanted to see whether the variation in rationality in the laboratory can explain household wealth differentials. Why we were motivated by this? We were motivated by this because, of course, uh, wealth is the measure that we economists will take for well-beings, of course. You know, we all like wealth. And secondly, um, there is kind of a puzzle about the question who accumulates more wealth. Because if you take people with the same characteristics, same education, same household, same even path of income, uh, during their life they will develop very, very different levels of wealth. So wealth accumulation cannot be explained by standard observables or standard unobservables. And what we actually show that this measure that is coming from the experiment, measure of economic rationality that is founded in economics theory can explain a large uh, fraction of the variations in wealth, even after controlling for many, many, many things and for alternative measures that are coming from psychology and coming from surveys. So uh, we looked at it as a great success <laughs> for economics. <laughs> so in uh, one of these series of papers, you um, y you take an approach which enables you to distinguish between um, an individual's preference for giving and an individual's social preferences. Yes. Um, that's a very interesting distinction. Is there anything that they have in common uh, yes. for, for an individual? What, what do you find? Yes. So, um, you know, 
people talked uh, a lot about uh, distributional or social, pre social preferences, and this is basically the preferences that govern our attitudes towards taxation, redistribution, development, charitable giving, many, many important, many, many important domains. Uh, what we do in this paper, we distinguish the trade-offs that you make between your own consumption and the consumptions of another person, and the trade-offs that you make between the consumptions of two other people. In particular, we distinguish between what we basically call fair-mindedness. Fair-mindedness is basically that you are putting equal weight on your consumption and the consumptions of someone else. And we distinguish between equity efficiency trade-offs. Now, I think the best way to illustrate the difference is that, uh, you know, in the United States, we would say that, you know, Democrats uh, have social preferences or distributional preferences weighted towards equality. And Republicans have distributional preferences weighted towards efficiency. However, you know, I think there is, there is no evidence to say that Democrats are more fair-minded than Republicans. You know, it's going back to uh, Rawls and, uh, and Harsani. So uh, what we found in this paper is that people equity efficiency trade-offs is the same, are the same, whether basically they are the one that are going to benefit or they are not in from the group of people that are going to benefit. Meaning basically that my equity efficiency trade-off when I'm allocating money between me and you will be exactly the same when my equity efficiency trade-off when I'm allocating money between you and another person. However, fair-mindedness is not the same. If I need to allocate money between two unknown others, I will be fair-minded. Basically, I will put equal weight on, themself, on the two people. But when I'm in the equation, I need to allocate money between myself and someone else, then I will put basically more weight on myself. And I think that we identified in this way what is exactly the deviation from impartiality and impersonality that, you know, Rawls, Arsani, and of course the enormous literatures that uh, follow them um, identified. And we did it, uh, the technique for doing this was actually uh, showing subjects in the laboratory three-dimensional budget sets where they basically played dictator games where there were different prices of free allocating the money between themselves and two other subjects. So this experimental technique that we talked about it's not that you can only present subjects with two-dimensional budget set, you can actually present them with even three-dimensional budget set, which is of course important, for example, to answering this question. Um, we don't know how to do four-dimensional <laughs> budget sets, of course. But basically you have developed an experimental platform that uh, lets you investigate all these separate questions. Y yes. In, in the so one of the, thi one of the things that you know, we, are, we are now actually moving to do, we are moving to study with this experimental design, you can basically study lots of types of trade-offs, uh, risk versus return, money today versus money tomorrow, uh, self versus other, and we are studying the linkages uh, between the preferences in all of this environment. And of course, the fact that we have a single experimental procedure that subjects are doing in all of these experiments help us to have a clean comparison of behavior across environments. Um, so you have a, a recent theoretical paper uh, with a very intriguing title. Um, <laughs> uh, does character a matter? <laughs> yes, a paper should have an intriguing title. Th yeah. this, this one yeah, is quite special. So does character matter? Uh, and you're talking about the uh, president's character. Yes. Uh, can you? Yes. So, um, you know, uh, there, is, uh, there, is a, there is view in political science that basically uh, the character of the president will determine uh, his presidency. In some sense, it's all about your character. And character uh, is something that a person uh, develops uh, early in life before his presidency. And, um, I, you know, we were especially motivated by uh, what actually few presidents uh, said. And if you read the paper, there is a, there is a wonderful quote uh, from Richard Nixon <laughs> uh, that the presidency is all about character. And there is another quote from Ronald Reagan who said something like, 
uh, that you can know a lot about someone's character by the way he is eating jelly beans. So <laughs> now uh, the example that we actually give there is uh, Gary Hart. So Gary Hart was of course a, a front runner for in the Democratic uh, primaries, um, and then he was uh, caught. Uh, on a boat with a woman, not his wife, and much younger than him. And of course, this, uh, basically, uh, this basically destroyed um, uh, his chances and he pulled out of the, of the race. And many people basically said that the reason was not that it basically showed something about his morality, but that this behavior is very risky. So the question that we are asking is, uh, whether if someone, let's say, invest aggressively, if someone is smoking, if someone uh, uh, cheats on his wife, uh, all of these behaviors are very basically risky. But these be behaviors are risky in the personal domain. It has consequences only for the candidate himself. However, uh, this uh, seems to be that uh, people are putting a lot of weight on this when they decided whether they should vote for someone uh, for public office, especially the presidency. So basically the question that we formed is as follows, you know, this type of thing that the voter seems to do uh, makes sense only if there is some linkage between risk taking in the private domain to risk taking in the public domain. So the first thing that we did is basically, I think we defined what we thought political scientists mean when they say character. And we identified it with risk preferences. You can identify it with other types of preferences, but you know, we identified it with risk preferences. And the question, which I think is, a, is extremely important, is uh, whether we can learn for someone's behavior in the private domain to basically how he's going to behave in the public domain once he is in office. And the conclusion of this paper that this linkage exists, you, we basically constructed necessary and sufficient condition for the linkage. However, we feel that, that conditions are strong, and it's hard to imagine that the voter will basically have, even if the conditions are met, it's hard to imagine that the average voter is basically going to have the information to follow the linkage. So, you know, so um, we were all, in the last elections, we were all obsessed by, we want to see Romney's tax returns. Now, you know, what can you see from his tax returns? You know, in some sense, we know how rich he is. We don't, we don't need his tax returns. I think that what we wanted to learn from his tax returns is basically how, you know, how much risk he is taking, uh, how aggressive he is when he invests. And also, maybe, you know, from the tax returns, you can know something about his social preferences, you know, how much he gives to charity. And, but you know, this, uh, these are behaviors in the private domain. And you know, the only way for us to explain the interest of the public is that it can give them information about whether Romney is going to do a good job as a president. So we were basically motivated by this and established these links. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot do experiments with presidents. <laughs> that's really <laughs> so unfortunate. It's I mean, very unfortunate. We this do is, them, but that, they're not so controlled. <laughs> absolutely. This is very unfortunate. But we, we need to admit that there is a huge, there, there is heterogeneity, you know, differences across countries. In the U.S., we are kind of obsessed with what our leaders are doing in the private domain. The French seem to care about it much less. Okay, so, you know, maybe the French got it right.